So ladies and gentlemen, that's our seven panelists. And uh, with a little uh, touch of magic, I'm now turning Rasmus from somebody who answers questions into somebody who asks questions. Because the idea is now that we have a discussion amongst the panelists to start off with. Yeah, I think uh, I would be curious to ask our colleagues from uh, uh, both from South America and from India. But when you sort of consider your country and you go sort of down through the hierarchies of, of government at national level and at district level and, and in terms of sort of how well is this incorporated in academia and civil society, what is your feeling? I mean, is this an agenda that has caught up? And is it sort of a national agenda in, in the countries that you represent? Excellent. Shakti I'm going to start with you. Um, SDG has become a compilation uh, rather than a conviction. That's something that we have seen uh, as far as the government is concerned. You know, we were looking at uh, uh, you know how we fare in, in, in various aspects related to poverty, education, healthcare, and everything. And we have found that education expense on education is you know at this million of expense on healthcare has even actually reduced from last 10 years. The expense on uh, expense on education has reduced. So in that sense, I'm very doubtful about the conviction of the governments to the, to the, to the uh, you know, uh, 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 actually the, the goal itself and its targets. The goal is, you know, uh, in, 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 in vision for your development uh, agenda. You, your, your target is not going to serve the purpose. I'll give you a very small example of, you know, um, providing employment. You know, there's a huge uh, industry in India called shipbreaking industry. Okay, ships come from the Middle East and, uh, and even Australia for breaking it in, in the country, and it's in it's a at one point of the freight. So it's, it's 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 actually creating a lot of you know uh, climate uh, you know the, uh, underwater you know changes. And the people, a lot of fishermen are uh, you know, losing you know employment and livelihoods because the fish, particularly the prawns, move in a direction in particular season. And when the ship breaking happens, the temperature increases there, and also the chemicals, it is all, you know, oil and chemical ships which are being broken there. So it affects the entire water and ecosystem, and uh, people are losing uh, you know, livelihood opportunities. We, as an institution, is locating ourselves in the space occupied uh, between the civil society and the academia. We, we have a very good collaboration. So we, together with uh, a lot of organizations, put pressure on the government bring research research and we currently are doing a research on fishing abilities. It is much more of you know kind of a achieving the targets and not so much about achieving the goals. How do you estimate uh, conviction levels in well, Colombia? You are asking me at the national level and the first thing that comes to my mind, my, my, my mind is what is a nation in Colombia. So we have is a fragmented society and uh, they look the global are to some extent <coughs> local problems, but not all of them. We have different agendas. People are doing, are surviving, are <coughs> growing their economies. So, what, to which extent this list or this system, let's go forward, the system of desires of the society are now in place in regional, in local governments, in communities, in civil society. And this is a question to be solved. I won't say that the governments are asking, are, are reflected to the, uh, to the people's needs through the sustainable de development goal. It might be the, the other way around. People are asking the governments to act in many issues. And it's a very complex process. For me, the key issue is how to, to build local, as you said, global and local issues, things that are interconnected. Otherwise, what we are seeing is the political fragmentation. Political fragmentation, not policy, political, is very, very worrisome now in South America. Look at Bolsonaro. Think a minimum. Um, consensus in society about what our future could be. And this is a tremendous complex process seen from the political uh, sciences and, and, the, and the politics itself. 
So, Herman, I'm going to invite you to uh, ask a question to one of the other panelists. They're changing. Business are changing. People are getting more concerned. But the, but the environment and the biodiversity is collapsing. So, how would you deal from this private sector with this, uh, what I would call, misfit, time line misfit? Because your agenda seems to be very good for 2018, for 20, 30, uh, 100 years, and the planet is already showing that we already changed it. Mm -hmm. So how would you deal with this time misfit? Yeah. The urgency, the crisis. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'll um, so we have we have a, a short term and a long term uh, perspective and, and actions. Uh, so, so short term, we, we listen to the scientists, uh, to the universities, uh, to learn what, what is really urgent, what is really important, and, and to understand how do we impact uh, those topics from our business models and from our products. And then we do whatever we can uh, to reduce uh, the negative impacts and to innovate with products that may have a positive uh, contribution. Uh, for example, we, are, we just uh, committed to, to uh, uh, CO2 emission reduction targets that is aligned with the 1.5 degrees pathway, and we will be uh, recognized for that in, at the UN General Assembly in New York uh, a few weeks uh, from now uh, as one of 30 companies in the world that has taken that forward step. I mean, there's a lot more we can do if we synchronize with policy, if we synchronize with, with consumers. And so, so we also, we advocate, uh, we are one of the advocates for putting a, a solid price on carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, we advocate for stronger regulations mm -hmm. uh, wherever we are in Brazil, in, in China, in India, where we have, have business and where we work with governments and, and regulators. So we, we, we see the need for stronger regulation and, and we show uh, governments and regulators that there are technologies available uh, to deliver to the needs of, of people and societies. Uh, so there is a reason to, to tighten the regulations. So in many ways we behave like, a, uh, like an NGO. Uh, and and uh, we do that because it's the right thing to do for the world, and we do that because uh, the more the world synchronizes with the sustainability agenda, the more business we have as a company. So it, again, the business profit motive is, is in the bag all the time. So I, I think I, I'll ask the former <coughs> minister of finance. <laughs> so why is it so difficult to internalize the externalities and get a, a price on, on pollution? Well, there is no doubt whatsoever that what you just said about stronger regulations, some stronger support for sustainable activity and investment and consumption, and higher prices on the unsustainable behavior is, uh, they, is all necessary tools as well as technological development, whatever. <coughs> sustainable development is not only climate, it's not only uh, environment, it's also social sustainability. And if you will use the uh, regulations and the price mechanisms, intervention in the price mechanisms, taxes, subsidies, whatever, uh, to push forward this thing, you have to remember the social dimension. And, and the, the exact example from France, from, from from uh, Macron is well it was right to raise the price of gasoline and diesel. But it was necessary to keep in mind that the low paid family living far away from their jobs in the city, having no uh, uh, option of, of uh, collective transportation, mm -hmm. having not the money to buy an electric car, they should not be those who pay for, 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 for the change. If you don't manage the social engineers, if you, if you push the bill for the change to the poor people, yes. you will be undermining the whole thing. Well, I, I could uh, 
maybe ask uh, the gentleman from, from India and Latin America uh, the question uh, about exporting the Danish example also to your business life. Mm -hmm. Because the Danish example represented here by Klaus, but also the Danish example as a historical development is we got the good jobs and uh, uh, a compared with our size as a nation and lion's share of the, of the global market because we took political decisions uh, supporting uh, better coverage uh, for health service free of charge uh, for everybody 100 years ago and some decades ago we decided we should have more sustainable energy consumption uh, and, and less carbon-based energy consumption and what we did our political framework decisions we actually uh, pushed forward supporting those companies that could deliver the technologies and products necessary uh, for these solutions mm -hmm. we got out of the world market this is a good business case as uh, told us. Uh, but it needs government regulation <laughs> And uh, how far away or how close is that discussion in Latin America or in India? Excellent. Herman, we're starting off with you. Can you see that model of pushing it with regulation working in Colombia? Uh, people will go to the streets mm -hmm. if more regulation will come. I don't see this coming. I see the environment against the social coming up and then taking political side. But I don't see that coming soon unless we set a device, uh, a transformative change in the economy in a way that it um, shares benefits by design, mm -hmm. not just by the market. Let's hear if prospects are perhaps slightly uh, more promising in India. How do you see it? Would that model work? More and more pain, more dice. Those kind of things have been tried out. Whether there are different ways of you know, circumventing all these kind of regulations. So what kind of regulation would bring that kind of a sense of responsibility and accountability on the business and also on the states is something which we have never understood. We have brought in recently the goods and services tax which is differently applied for different you know, industries and products and things like that. That has actually affected small and medium industries much more than the big industries. Because big industries always have a different way of circumventing and you know, evading tax. And incentivization in terms of sustainable business should get much more incentives from the state. Tax rebates. Some of the things have never been tried out. Because there is an investment from the government for the, those kind of uh, uh, you know uh, incentivization, which the governments are not committed to do. Sure. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stina. I want also to give you the opportunity to ask a question to uh, the panel. My big challenge in uh, in working with uh, UNDP and the SDG accelerator is that uh, not that there. <laughs> that's a good thing. There is a lot of demand from country offices to take this model and methodology and bring it to different places in the world. But what I think is very important is also that other actors outside UNDP takes a model and a methodology uh, that can work with small and medium-sized companies and uh, increase the volume of business solutions being developed to help us meet the SDGs. Yeah, I'm asking Klaus here, and uh, maybe I should ask you because you have a lot of knowledge about technology and circular economy. So I'm asking to qu this question. Um, what could you do to actually make uh, external actors <coughs> to, to pick up on a methodology and tool that's already invented and make them run with it? Thomas, let's start with you. <coughs> well, I think it's if you want to involve people or companies or politicians or any stakeholders, you need to also involve them in the development of the tool. I think uh, it's a lot about ownership. Involvement is not just uh, applying technology. So we need to develop the technologies in collaboration with the, with the stakeholders. We need to take more attention to this concept of co-innovation and multi-stakeholder approaches in, in research. Not only in, in how we do research, but also how we fund research. Uh, 
uh, when research funds in like uh, Horizon program in, in the EU, the next generation of, uh, of Europe uh, 2020 will need to focus more on, um, on stakeholder uh, involvement and co-innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm from business and we are very simple people. Mm -hmm. um, so for people to do something different, to make a decision about doing changing behavior, they, has to, they have to be able to see what's in it for me. That's in business, that's in everywhere. And so you really need to, to have that in mind when, when there is a, an audience of, of small and medium-sized enterprises or others that you want to do something different. Can you ask a question to Maurice about... That would be the very last before we all participants, but why not? Well, let's be generous, please. Because this has been one of the biggest issues uh, in Addis Ababa, the, the, the financing. Well, there has been, over the past five, five years at least, very much more focus from the World Bank and the regional development banks on financing sustainable development. And I think also that what, what we see, at least in, in this part of the world, is that pension funds have uh, engaged themselves much, much more in being in the forefront of sustainable development. That's very, very necessary because only in the infrastructure of energy, transportation, city planning, garbage handling, and so on, we will have to invest several thousands of billion US dollars globally in order to reach the sustainable growth. So, so uh, this mobilization is, is necessary, but not sufficient, of course. If we don't do what Klaus uh, said originally, make it much more obvious that the sustainable investment <coughs> is a good business, we will not be able to reach the goals. But it takes political action to change the market conditions. Mm -hmm. So what would motivate politicians to, to act? Uh, I think that brings us back uh, to, to the uh, Necessity of education. I, uh, we have this slogan <coughs> SDGs from ABC to PhD. <laughs> no one leaving the educational system from now on should be without knowledge of the urgent necessity of action. Mm -hmm. And in particular, those who are going to design the future architecture of society, be it architects, engineers, uh, economists, not least. I think that's where the, the most deep re-education has to take place. <laughs> uh, and political sciences. So, so it's, it's about all this. And this is so something of the kind already happening in the latest general election in this country. Because it was actually possible for the first time to bring at least the climate agenda on top of the discussion. And it was reflected in the results uh, of the election and then the new government. So that's what it's all about, of course, uh, raising the uh, uh, understanding of this and the cause of progressive uh, companies, business people joining in saying this is also good for future employment in this country. At least in a Danish context, my, my sense, and this is both working with the private sector, with the political system and, and, and the civil society sector, is that um, the sense of urgency by far has reached sort of civil society and the private sector uh, first and hardest. Yeah. So we are struggling with the political level, and, and please correct me more, so yeah. if you think I'm wrong, but, but this, is, this is where we sort of have a backlog in terms of sort of regulating and, and, and doing sort of concrete legislation in support of the agenda that perhaps you will find from it. Uh, what if they don't? Uh, how can we move uh, with what is repressed here in terms of sort of radical transformation without political support? And I think we can. And I think the private sector is a, is a strong proof. Uh, regardless of Trump's uh, ridiculousness, uh, so many companies and so many states in the US are moving into they don't care. National governments are far behind, but local governments are much more ahead. And it's very important because the, the, the mayors of the major cities of this world, they are at 
they, they take action. And that's where the majority of the people live, that's where the majority of production takes place, that's where the majority of pollution takes place. And that's where, where the major investment in a different sustainable infrastructure has to take place. So there is for interaction, but there's not nearly as sufficient for interaction for national. Hi, my name is Christina. I have worked in uh, the investment industry for five years, actually, so a bit in your corner as well. Um, you talked a bit about pension funds. And they are a great player, but they do not invest a lot of money in green investments. Thank you very much. We're going to start off with uh, a response from uh, Stine. First of all, thank you for bringing this up, because I think this is actually a major driver for SDG impact to transform uh, that sector and make investments go towards the SDGs, basically. Um, and I'll pick up on some of your questions because you actually <coughs> asked quite a lot. So the last one was about the consumer. What I see out there is that there are a lot of banks and yeah, banks that actually challenged with the fact that um, their customers they don't know that they can actually put money into sustainable investments, but they also realize that more and more uh, customers ask for those type of products. So they're working on it, and in UNDP we actually also working on it because we launched an initiative that target investors. It's called SDG Impact. It's not about us getting money from the institutional investors and stuff like that. It's about working with the institutional investors and other, like the larger private sector companies that also do investments and other investment type of actors and help them and capacitate them to actually transform their investment portfolios towards more sustainable investments. Thank you very much, Stine. Most the, the regulations on uh, institutional investors with the, the, the extreme supremacy of profit uh, as regulation, of course, can be modified and changed and should be. Uh, but we also have to increase the understanding of the fact that with, for instance, climate change coming so quickly, long-term investments will be less and less profitable if they are not sustainable. And, and the, the, the whole point about the institutional investors is that they are actually interested in long-term and there may be not that much conflict between the highest long-term profit and sustainability as uh, there may be is expected. By the way, insurance companies could do a lot to improve their understanding by placing a higher risk premium on the unsustainable yeah. Thank you much. One more comment from Rasmus and then we open the floor again. We, we are having discussions with our uh, insurance companies and pensions and, and what and sort of trying to do our advocacy work with them. And, and from those conversations what I pick up is that um, uh, they are definitely in a transition. Mm -hmm. And they have seen that the generation that comes after this generation here is putting up very, very different requirements to how they invest. And uh, if they don't sort of get that act together, uh, now, uh, they will basically lose business. And they see for themselves a window of sort of 10, 15 years, and if they haven't been able to sort of change their investments portfolio by then, they are losing customers. Because uh, a newer generation is coming. Thank you, Rasmus. Let's uh, hear another contribution from the floor. Hi. Hi. My name is Rekha Manhart. This is a question for Mons. Now you are... Uh, your party is, uh, is back in business, back in government. And, uh, and I'm wondering, you said we had a really, really green election. The voters have clearly indicated that this is the direction we want to go. So how far away are we from all public spending, like all sourcing that we spend, like public money being green, like being sustainable? Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on uh, from municipalities and regions actually buying green. It should be even more favorable for any public sector actor actually to act to, uh, 
in the direction of sustainable spending of money. The, the question of green public procurement is not only a question about uh, money, no, that's, no. that's one part of it, but it, it's also about <coughs> organization and about knowledge. In the, in, for example, in a, in a typical Danish municipality, you would have uh, the, the staff that is buying uh, it, it be organized under the economy part of the municipality, and you'll have all the knowledge about the environmental impacts uh, placed in, a, in another part of the, of the organization. To, and, and typically, they would not entertain much knowledge. So it's a, both a, a question of, of money, of course, if it's cheaper in the, in the short term, most likely they will be uh, more uh, restricted. Uh, but it's also a question about knowledge and knowledge transfer and other things. I'm uh, Jahan, master student at Roscoe University. Uh, I have a question uh, based on what you said earlier, Mons, with uh, Macron and uh, uh, how that it, uh, it has affected the economy where the poorest are getting mostly affected by it. Uh, you see the same thing happening in the private sector where lead firms are forcing the different parts of the global value chain uh, to be green um, and calling themselves self-green by doing this, not doing it anything themselves. It's called green capital formation. Uh, how do you see uh, the possibilities to prevent this? in the future? I think the answer is transparency. Uh, you need transparency through the supply chains. Uh, and, you need, and there are organizations that are trying to organize this to make sure that the information you get uh, from the, the first ends in the supply chains are uh, credible and, and valid and, and represent the realities out there. And I think transparency is uh, a killer of, of sustainability fraud. Uh, so I definitely think that's part of the solution. Uh, but I think in general it is, uh, it is positive that, that big companies put pressure on their supply chains to, to perform better on sustainability and, and environmental issues. But of course it has to be, uh, it has to be balanced, and it has to be constructive so that the small companies uh, don't just go bankrupt and, and work themselves to death, but they actually improve. Um, I think uh, one of the companies in the, in the world that has the most power and that has been blamed a lot for their harsh behavior towards suppliers is Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, for many good reasons, Walmart have, a, have still a bad reputation, but they should certainly also be recognized for what they've done in the past 10 years in, in driving a lot and a lot of improvements through their supply chains by uh, upping uh, requirements on environment and sustainability. Uh, Walmart is, uh, and has been for the last 10 years one of the strongest drivers of the, the better performance in many, many surprises all over the world. And uh, two years ago, Walmart initiated a, a project called Project Gigaton, where they declared that they will take out one gigaton of CO2 by 2030 uh, from their supply chains in collaboration with their suppliers. And that alone is, is I think, more than half of the US commitment to the, to the Paris Agreement. So, so, so yeah, fuck Trump. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Can you make a point? Yes, you can. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Ricky Nadin from the Green New Age Alliance. My question concerns the possibilities and the opportunities to strengthen cooperation between academia, the private sector, uh, civil society and also the UN. We talked about the need for data and research being produced and, and, and uh, integrated in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, in the work in society, as well as the need for innovation in cooperation with uh, a range of partners in society, etc. Uh, from this discussion, how would you see that we can strengthen this form of cooperation, also perhaps across continents. Yeah, well, I think it's evident that we cannot solve any of these uh, questions that we have or problems that we have without collaborations. Uh, and I think also that's uh, well, uh, yeah, that's a necessity that we need to collaborate with civil society, universities, uh, companies, and, and politicians. And I think that the gaps that we have sort of identified today political will, uh, lack of investments, uh, etc. The only way that we can deal with these gaps uh, is, that we, uh, is that we join together to sort of force politicians to take actions on these parts. We force uh, investors to, uh, to invest green uh, 
and the way that the most effective way of doing that is, is in collaboration. Um, Herman, can I move to you at this point and, and yeah. also ask you to respond to the question raised by Rege? I mean, how do you see the possibilities uh, as an academic, but also within the broader context of partnerships? I would say that uh, what I've seen in my life as professor for the last 10, 12 years, I was trained in biology. I am come from the natural sciences. And uh, what I've seen is that people's motivations do change. They're not so simple as the economy might be willing to, to, to interpret. You know? How to change what people want when to do? I'm working now with the IPES, which is the International uh, Panel of uh, Diversity and Ecosystem Services, the UN body, a uh, technical body. And one of the questions of the past uh, global biodiversity assessment, which was launched in Paris in uh, May uh, this year, is that biodiversity, for example, if I ask you what is biodiversity, you might know something. But biodiversity is not an environmental issue. It's a development issue. Please read the, the summary for policy makers. It's a very good piece of work. Biodiversity, whatever we, we can recognize in trees and birds and in all ecological process, is a development issue. So we need to educate and to collaborate to answer the question through the network because we need to change the way people are still putting the natural, the, 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 the economic and the, and the environmental issues at home. We need to change the way we do. And for us, of course, belonging to this uh, alliance is great because I've seen here uh, very good ideas and processes of how to change education, so how to improve, how, how to innovate. And this for me has been very, very interesting and I thank you very much because I've seen things that we are thinking to do there and you're doing already here. So collaboration in education and research will be very, very valuable uh, thing to, to work before and uh, afterwards. We're hearing the bells of the uh, Copenhagen City Hall, which means that time is up. But I don't know, Mons, if I could ask you, since we started off with you in the first introduction of the panel, just to tell us what you take with you from our discussion here today. Well, it seems we've all uh, heard the, the right questions and concerns about how we have to do this. Uh, but also the question of, of, of contribution to, well, is actually working, uh, we need to do much, much more. And that's the answer to the last question about partnerships for goals, uh, goals 17. It's not only that all the 17 goals are totally interconnected in the community. It's also that uh, solutions will only be reached when all kind of partners work together the uh, United Nations cannot uh, decide what nation states or regions do. They can make uh, comparisons, they can tell who is good, who is bad, and, and, and inspire action. But it's on the national level, and in Europe, in particular on the uh, European level also, that uh, uh, the regulations, the tax systems, uh, the funds raising for sustainable action should be made. That is not enough. If business is not on board, if investors, pension funds, capital funds are not on board also, uh, at, uh, it will take a cooperation on innovation between prioritization of innovation uh, concerning sustainable development between the state and the companies to reach the goals also. And then finally we have the local company, the local consumer, the local citizen. Because each and every of us is not only a consumer that can act differently, we are also a citizen that can vote with, with these uh, serious uh, instructions and words and reflections on the day, I conclude our meeting, except um, there is the opportunity now for uh, refreshments and networking. I would even suggest one might venture.